So today is Presentation Weekend. Presentation Weekend or Presentation Sunday is an actual day on the church calendar. And a friend of ours, a friend of Gigi and mine, is a pastor in America. And one year, uh, he always was quite careful to follow the church calendar. But one year, he determined that he would preach the whole year through the church calendar. And in January, on Presentation Sunday, he prepared a message about why did Joseph and Mary present Jesus into the temple. When he had prepared that, the Lord encouraged his heart. The Lord spoke to his heart. And on that Sunday, he prayed for those couples that were there that were wanting to have children but were not able to have children. And it turned out to be a wonderful service, and the Lord answered a number of their prayers. And so he felt like he wanted to do that every year. So I, I think it was about 30 years ago he started this practice. Uh, as a fairly well-known church in the Seattle area. It was kind of interesting because my mother used to send me clippings from the newspaper. And after a few years, the newspaper would report on it. Every year I would get the clippings. The first few years, the clippings were mostly sarcastic. They would interview doctors who would say things about them, and it would be kind of like, imagine this, these people are praying like that. Well, well, Pastor Joe's a, a way more organized person than me, so everyone who came up to pray for her, they were asked their name, they were asked their contact information, and, and, and then they were followed up. And uh, pretty soon it became clear that about one-third of the people that were prayed for in his church had children, either through uh, a normal conception or with medical assistance or adoption, because it's very clear all those three are a great answer to prayer. And it was really funny to watch. Pretty soon, some of the biggest shows in America, uh, uh, 2020 and a couple of the other big nighttime shows, were sending crews. And people were coming literally from all over the world, from all of the states first, and then some from all over the world to be prayed for, some of them not even believers. And it was funny to watch the newspapers because where the newspapers were at first ridiculing it, later on they began to say sympathetic things. And they would quote the doctors as saying, yeah, uh, we understand that when couples will pray and ask prayer, then it helps them relax, and it's a good thing for them, and there's a better chance that they can conceive and stuff like that. So we've seen this. So when my wife and I first came here, and IES was started 19 years ago, we began this as well. This is the 19th year we as a church will be praying for couples. Now, it's a little bit different here in Indonesia than it was in the States. Interestingly enough to me, most of the time in the States, we're praying for couples that wanted to have children but not, had not been able to have children. In Indonesia, we pray for couples who wanted to have children and not able. We've had some wonderful miracles uh, in Indonesia. We've also prayed for couples who have had children but want to have more children. And we've also prayed for couples who have had children of one gender but would like children of the other. So we have couples that have all boys and they want to have a girl. We've had couples that have all girls and want to have a boy. And, and we gladly pray for all of those things. We've even had couples that didn't want to have any more kids where they snuck out before the prayer time. They were a little bit nervous. And uh, that borders on superstition, but uh, we're understanding in some of those cases. So that's what we're going to be doing here today. We'll be doing this prayer at the end of the service. And before we begin the prayer time, I will instruct you of all these things. But we want to understand where does this come from, and the idea or the celebration of Presentation Weekend comes from Scripture. In fact, from Luke chapter 2, for those of us who are doing so, we just read these verses a few days ago. And so we're going to read these passages of Scriptures together. We're going to ask, what is it all about? What is it saying in that particular context? What does it mean to us, and what are we supposed to do? So would you all stand to your feet at this time? So let's read together from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 24, and then 39 and 40. Let's read. Let everybody read out loud. Then when the days stipulated by Moses for purification were complete, they took him up to Jerusalem to offer him to God as commanded in God's law. Every male who opens the womb shall be a holy offering to God and also to sacrifice a pair of doves or two young pigeons prescribed in God's law. When they finished everything required by God in the law, they returned to Galilee and to their own town, Nazareth. There the child grew strong in body and wise in spirit, and the grace of God was on him. Let's pray together. Wonderful Lord, we thank you for this privilege that we have, not only to open your word, but Lord, we're going to have the privilege to pray for people a little bit later. And we thank you that we have a privilege of prayer. God, we know that you are the creator of everything that you are outside of everything that's natural. Everything that you do is supernatural. You do miracles. You, you, you open up doors spiritually. You lead us and guide us, Lord. You speak through your word. You speak through your prophets. You speak through your people, Lord. You accomplish amazing things. And we are thankful that we are able to be a part of that. 
And we pray, Father, that our understanding of you would be based on your word and on your spirit in our hearts and lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats again. Now, in this story, we're told by Luke, and, and, and Luke has got some understanding, some instruction, some people who have told him what happened, because he wasn't an eyewitness, and why it happened, and we're told that these things happened. They went up to offer up a, uh, uh, an offering based on every male who opens a womb will be an offering to God, and that they had to sacrifice a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So they go up, they present the baby, and then they bring either two doves or two pigeons, and they present them as an offering to the Lord. What's that all about? Why isn't it that when we have families present their children here before the Lord, why is it that we don't ask them to bring pigeons or doves? You know, what, what, what is that all about? So let's try and understand what's going on here. Now, the things that Luke puts in and talks about here are from the Old Testament, And the understanding of the message of the Old Testament that we're shown is that every firstborn male offspring belongs to the Lord, and an offering was given to buy them back. In Numbers chapter 18, verses 15, it says, The first offspring of every womb, both man and animal, that is offered to the Lord is yours. Now, who's the yours? You're going to see that in a minute. But you must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. Okay, let's back up a little bit. Numbers was given. It was God's word spoken to his people, possibly, many people believe, recorded by Moses with bits filled in a little bit later after the time of Moses' death. They're moving into the promised land. Now, you remember, in the promised land, God gave every tribe and every sub-tribe and uh, eventually down to every family, he gave them space that was theirs. He gave them a portion of the land. And that portion was theirs to provide for their family. God made rules. So, for instance, if you had somebody who was leading the family who wasn't very wise or made bad decisions, they could sell their property that belonged to their family, but they couldn't sell it forever. It had to go back at the end of seven years. So even if they went bankrupt and all those things, even if they were sold into slavery, they would be set free. So God's provision for each tribe, for each clan, for each family was adequate for them. But there was one group of people that didn't have a provision of land. They didn't have a portion. Those were the Levites. Now, the responsibility of the Levites was for them to uh, lead worship, to preside in the temple, to represent the people before God, to receive and participate in the things that happen, the sacrifices and all of those kinds of things. Now, the Levites didn't have, they didn't have a portion. They didn't have land. And as part of God's plan, the lesson here being that the Levites would be provided for by God in a more direct manner. So you understand if you're a farmer and you have a crop and you plant your crop and God provides water and it grows, God has provided that for you. But for the Levites, the provision was a little bit more direct. It went like this. There was a sacrificial system. And the people were supposed to take what they had raised, take what they had grown, if it was their, if their, it was their herds, if they were ga- gathering sheep or whatever it was, or if they were gathering grain. And they took some of that and they brought it up to the temple at different times of the year and they offered it there before the Lord. Now, this is what would happen. For instance, if their offering was a sheep, a sheep was a clean animal, it was a good offering, that sheep would be sacrificed before the Lord, and a small portion of that sheep would be burned. It would be burned completely. This idea of complete consumption, complete uh, destruction that would be done to the sacrifice was a way of saying it, it was for God, because nobody could ever use it after that. However, the priests, the Levites who served in the temple, they received the other part of the animal. So the animal was slaughtered according to the rules, and then it was divided up, and they received a part of it. And interestingly enough, part of what the family brought into Jerusalem went to them. It provided for them because they were gathering in these different festivals, especially the Feast of Tabernacles, and they also ate some of the lamb, and and they provided in all of the different things that God had provided. So this was God's way of providing an act of worship, this was God's way of providing for the, the, the Levites, who were the priests and the one uh, working in the worship, and it was God's way of providing for his own people. And so that was something that they did as well. Now, there was a very specific statement that was given. The firstborn male of every womb 
belong to God. There was a purpose in that. I'll touch on that purpose for a minute. However, if the firstborn male, for instance, of a lamb, of a sheep was a lamb, then that lamb belonged to God and was to be sacrificed to God in the manner that I just mentioned. If the animal was an unclean animal, it couldn't be sacrificed to God. So the list of unclean animals, I, I tried to make an illustration in the earlier service about a lobster, and then because lobsters are unclean. And then I realized you don't raise lobsters, so it doesn't really work. But uh, assuming that they raised some kind of unclean animal or caught some kind of unclean animal, and then they would bring it in. It couldn't be sacrificed. It wasn't intended for the sacrifice. It was a reminder that God had provided it, and they bought it back. And then, for the firstborn son, of course God doesn't condone human sacrifice. Absolutely not. This is what made them different from all the people around them. They would buy back that child. And so this was an act of worship. According to what it says in the NIV biblical commentary, seemingly the reason for paying a redemption price for a firstborn son and unclean animals and the sacrifice of the firstborn of clean animals was to provide a perpetual reminder that conception, birth, and life are the gifts of God. So through this process, in all of this other sacrificial process, through this one special process for the firstborn males, it's a reminder to every generation that God is the one who provides life. God is the one who controls conception. God controls both life and death. Now, the other thing that we see that's interesting in this story is, and we read that a little bit later in verse 23, the sacrifice was to be a lamb or doves or a pigeon if they were poor. Now think about that for a moment. This is the graciousness of our God. So our God says, I want to teach you an object lesson. When you have a son, I want you to bring him up as if you were going to sacrifice him to me. I want you to be obedient in that way. However, I'm not a God who requires that kind of sacrifice. So I'll give you the right to take your son back by redeeming him. If you want to think about it, there's a lot of really important theological considerations that can come in from learning this kind of system. But you're supposed to redeem him by replacing him with a lamb because the lamb can be sacrificed. But if you can't afford a lamb, you can bring a pair of doves or a pair of pigeons as a sacrifice. Now, why is that important? What does that say to us? It's important because not everybody could afford a lamb. God did not set up a system that was only for one kind of people, the people who could afford it. Everyone would be able to uh, uh, provide to put together a pair of doves or a pair of pigeons. I suppose, I, I may be wrong in this, I suppose that uh, they could even be captured and caught. So we see that this system here is that everybody has to acknowledge God's sovereignty in birth, in life, in conception, and everybody has to then redeem what is going to be offered up to God. What's important for us to understand is these are the rules and rituals that Mary and Joseph were following. They were obedient people. They were in the temple on that day, and they were following it because God prepared it as a lesson for them. Now, what do those things say to you and I today? Number one, conception, birth, and life are a gift from God. It's very easy for us in our more modern and our more medical and our more scientific sense to think of them as simply the results of, of a biology. But remember, who set the biology in order? Who created conception? Who created this process? God created the process. And we need to remember that it's his process. He is the master of that process, number one. Number two, our God is no respecter of persons. Our God is no respecter of persons. There is no item of worship. There is no ask of worship. There is no sacrifice of worship in those days or in our days that is out of reach for even the poorest of the followers. Because the sacrifices that God wants from us are broken and contrite hearts and surrender to him. And so even in this element of sacrifice, God made a way for those who were not able to uh, be able to provide a lamb or whatever it might be. This is the lesson of Presentation Weekend. Now, what are the three things that I want to apply to us today? Number one, I want us to remember that life comes from God. As you look through the Bible, you will find many different stories of, of couples that were not able to have children, and then God provided children for them. Now, there's some, some pretty 
complicated interpretation in some of those stories that people have maybe jumped to some wrong conclusions. But what we see over and over and over is that God gives life where there wasn't life. And we thank him and understand that. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we read, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. It is God who gives life. It is God who is in control of this process. In Acts chapter 17, there's this great line, and it's talking about God. And, and, and uh, 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 Paul says, He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. Man, isn't that devastating? We thought all this time we could bargain with God and offer him something that we had. He doesn't need us. He chooses us. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. In a few moments, we'll be praying for couples who are asking God to create life in their womb, asking God to create life in their family through natural process, through medically assisted process, through bringing an adopted child to them. We thank the Lord that we know that he is the God of life and he is the giver of life. Number two. Not only does life come from God, we learn in Scripture that we have an, we, our part is to be obedient and faithful. God calls us to be obedient and faithful. Obedience and faithfulness are the characters that we see in Joseph and Mary. The only other qualification that they needed to be to be the parents of Jesus was to be from the household of David. And yet we see them being obedient and faithful and God selecting them and choosing them for this amazing thing that he was going to do in this world because of their obedience and faithful. And we see that obedience lingering as long as we see them. We we lose track of Joseph after Jesus being 12 years old is up in the temple. We lose track of him after that. Mary, we, we see her again and again and again until in Acts we find out that she's part of the church on the day the Holy Spirit comes. But we see that they are they have characteristics of obedience and faithfulness, and we need to be that way. We need to be obedient and faithful, not just if we want the Lord to answer our prayers. We need to be obedient and faithful. I, 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 I love the testimony that you saw on video. We saw it live last night, the couple that came forward with their little daughter. Their daughter's name was uh, Gwen Samantha, and the Samantha comes from Samuel. And Samuel, the name Samuel means the Lord heard. And if you want to read 1 Samuel chapter 1 and chapter 2, maybe a little bit later, or if you get bored with me talking, you can do it now, and you'll read the story about how God heard Hannah's prayer and gave Hannah a child. And then you can understand what it means to know that the Lord hears your prayer. And then the third thing I want to talk about here before we go to the Lord in prayer is to understand that we come together in the name of the Lord to lift this prayer up. Now, when my wife and I first went to a church where they were celebrating uh, Presentation Weekend, they were honoring Presentation Weekend, they were praying, we actually had been talking to our friend. You know, when we were first married, we knew everything about everything. Or at least, my, my wife was more humble. I thought I knew everything about everything. And we decided, you know, after two years, we'll have a ch- child and, you know, so on and so forth. And two years after we were married, we got pregnant right away. We thought this is easy. And then we had a miscarriage. And I have told you before, I've been thinking about that miscarriage for the last 48 hours. It remains the hardest experience I've had in my life. And then we weren't able to get pregnant. We just didn't get pregnant months and then years. And so we were talking to our friend, and he said, hey, why don't you guys come and be prayed for on presentation weekend in my church, Joe? And I thought to myself, hmm, I don't really want to do that because I don't want to answer questions, and I don't, want to, I don't want to be embarrassed, and I don't want people knowing that I want to have a baby and we don't have a baby, and all of those different emotional kind of feelings and things that I have. And I told him, I said, well, you know, we're really busy. Probably we're busy somewhere on that Sunday. And as it turned out, we weren't, so we went there together. When the time came to pray, it was very, very, very hard for me to go to be prayed for. It wasn't hard for my wife. She had one simple desire. She wanted the Lord to give us a child. And because she went, I went, because I learned that I should follow my wife. Yeah, that's a wise thing to do. All the women said, amen. All the husbands pulled out their phone and started playing with their phone. I can't believe he sold us out like that. Yeah. And people prayed for us. It was a good experience. 
They loved us. They, there was nothing embarrassing about it. We wanted to have a child. We wanted to ask the Lord. And so we were prayed for, and, and not immediately, but in a period of time after that, the Lord answered our prayers, and our daughter's, you know, she's getting ready to be 22 years old in a little while. But I want to say to everybody who's here, this is important for you to understand. I know exactly how you feel. I know that some of you feel like you've, you've tried to have kids and you haven't been able to have kids and maybe you can just kind of not be prayed for. And I respect every decision of every, that every person makes. But if there's one place in the world where you will be loved and cared for, it's here in this church. Because everybody here wants your prayer to be answered and everybody here wants God to do a miracle for you. Everybody will be praying for you. I want to encourage people, although we are people who believe in miracles, absolutely, we want to encourage you to do everything medically possible. I think it's really important to understand that having your prayer answered through medicine is the same thing as having your prayer answered through uh, natural conception because God is the one who invented the abilities and the skills and talents and process by which children can be conceived. I also want to remind everybody that adoption is a godly solution to a prayer for children. Um, you and I, we're all adopted by God. We've been adopted into his family. There's none of us who belonged in his family by birth, but he adopted us all. And we of all people should be aware of that and conscious of what a wonderful solution adoption is.